You're very welcome back to Off The Ball. It is time for us now to have a look at the Sunday papers on the paper review. And you will do well outside of the Queen's Jubilee later this year to fit Crown into as many headlines as has been completed this Sunday. Uh, Crowned is the very simple one on the back of the Sunday Mirror on this Sunday. It is the Ireland team with their triple crown first since 2018 after yesterday's bonus point victory against Scotland in the rugby. Also, Tom Hopkinson on the back of the Mirror um, reporting on the fact that Sir Martin Brown the former chairperson of Liverpool who is in as one of the bidders for Chelsea says that Thomas Tuchel will be retained as manager if his bid proves to be successful and also Hamilton is miles off the pace ahead of the inaugural Bahrain Grand Prix which will open the new season in Formula 1 Mercedes who've dominated for the last decade back in 5th and ninth position respectively on the grid after qualifying yesterday similar theme in the back page of the Sun toast of the crown they've gone for uh, with the Ireland team uh, lifting the triple crown a rare occasion where silverware is actually raised at Lansdowne Road. Last time that Ireland won a triple crown back in 2004, there was no physical trophy for the competition. Also Bakaya Saka looking for more support from protection protection as well uh, from referees after he was left bloodied in their win for Arsenal 1-0 against Aston Villa yesterday afternoon. JT to the rescue, that is John Terry who has vowed to protect Chelsea's history, heritage and DNA in building the best club in the world. He has joined the £250 million True Blues Consortium who are aiming to take a 10% stake in the club as the UK government looks at those prospective bidders for Chelsea. And there's a lot about uh, John Terry and his comments across the papers today. Uh, the title on the back of the Sunday World is Crown and Glory is their headline showing Johnny Sexton uh, receiving the Triple Crown uh, his first piece of silverware to raise as Ireland captain. Also Paul McGrath has been writing about Ralph Ragnick the Manchester United manager on the week that they crashed out of Europe at the hands of Atletico Madrid saying United need a proper leader to progress and Liverpool are really turning the heat on City, the former Liverpool and Ireland striker John Aldridge, also in the Sunday World today. And a lot of the papers now looking forward to Ireland against Belgium and Lithuania in the upcoming friendlies after the squad was named. And Blue Foria is at the back of the Sunday World, which is looking at Chelsea's victory against Middlesbrough in the FA Cup as they put their off-the-field issues to one side to qualify for the semi-finals. An exclusive on the back of the Sunday people, Barcelona are ready to sign Paul Pogba. Barca have been making a lot of free signings, but Paul Pogba would be a very expensive one. Uh, report that they are willing to pay him around €300,000 a week if he were to sign and the fact that Barcelona have been boosted by their new deal with Spotify means they feel they could be competitive for Pogba who is out of contract at Manchester United this summer Hands Off is a Manchester United and Chelsea based story we see Thomas Tuchel on the back of the Sunday People and prospective Chelsea owner Sir Martin Broughton saying little chance that Thomas Tuchel will be allowed to leave the club this summer with Manchester United reportedly interested in making the European Cup winning boss their new manager uh, Crowning Glory is the front of the Sunday Independent Sport you can see Josh van der Fli going over his try at the Aviva Stadium in Ireland's bonus point victory against Scotland but France ultimately dashing the championship hopes with their pretty comfortable win against England in Paris last night also something we're going to be talking about in quite some detail the GPA row over expenses currently uh, quite a few former players have been hitting back at the GPA today including Colm O'Rourke and Joe Brawley who are both in the Sunday Independent talking about it today Mark O'Shea in the Daily Mirror is also discussing it from a player's perspective and history makers Rachel Blackmore a couple of days after she became the first woman to ride the winner of the Cheltenham Gold Cup. She is featured across a lot of the papers including uh, Eamon Sweeney's piece on the back of the Sunday Independent around Cheltenham has got a heavy focus around Rachel Blackmore. That is also the case with David Walsh today um, the fields of Athen Rye uh, discussed in that too but also heavily around uh, the star that is Rachel Blackmore. Three wins but all very significant ones at Cheltenham and second best is the headline the Sunday Times have gone with after Ireland finished up in second place in the Six Nations and finally in the Daily Mail where we'll also be talking about Stephen Kenny and some of his squad who are going further afield in England to play their football including Josh Cullen who's at Anderlecht they've gone with Silver Lining which is the second place finish in the Six Nations for Ireland so plenty to talk about but it would seem that the decks were really cleared for the rugby there's a lot of rugby content here I'd like to say Tommy Conlon sports writer and also Maura Thrasny Kallick sports journalist are with me how are you getting on folks? Good how are I'm you? Will. I'm uh, Will I'm Maura Thrasny Tommy, from what I'm looking at here, I think it's understandable that a lot of editors probably left a reasonable amount of space. I'm sure Stephen Kenny's press conference from Thursday ended up getting a bit of space left over as well. But the rugby really dominates the vast majority of the papers today. Yeah, and um, I mean, it is a sort of a boon for Sunday newspapers to have the first dibs on 
on uh, uh, any live action on the Saturday. But uh, when you've got a sort of the prover- uh, the proverbial Super Saturday in the Six Nations w- with the uh, last day, uh, three games being played and the title being decided, and in this case, the uh, Grand Slam being decided, um, the Sunday papers uh, are going to go big on it. And uh, albeit, uh, I can assure you how stressful it is for all the editors and sub-editors and reporters getting their copy in uh, on time and reasonably coherently. And, and uh, last night from Paris, I mean, it was 10 o'clock before uh, that game finish, finished up. So, I mean, uh, um, hats off as usual to everyone working on the desk in newspapers, in, be it London or Dublin or Paris or wherever. Uh, uh, there's a, probably not... Uh, fully appreciated how would it be fully appreciated but there's an incredible level of professionalism and uh, um, sort of uh, ability under pressure uh, to get uh, all the coverage that we see in the papers today yeah, because I always consider on this one, Tommy, you look at Stuart Barnes and Stephen Jones particularly, who've got yeah. reflective pieces on France against England. I would yeah. have thought it's a struggle to even get an on-the-whistle report in to get the paper published on time. But that's a game that finished where, look, at half-time, it looked like France were going to win, so maybe you could have had the outline of your article. But realistically, it takes a bit of reflection, it takes a bit of time to write that. And that was probably written pretty much up on the full-time whistle in order to get it into the paper, I would think. Yeah, exactly, Will. And uh, I, uh, Stephen Jones and the Sunday Times managed to even get in a, a, a nice humorous intro to his piece where he says, France have their grand slam, England have a bronze medal, but if they bit into it, it would fall apart in their mouths. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, so that would have been exceptionally, I would have thought, stressful for everyone involved in, the, in, in uh, France, in Paris, uh, but uh, uh, for England, France, and Paris. But anyway, they managed to they managed to get it done, and um, and uh, there's some great photography as well, and uh, hu- huge amounts of uh, you know. I mean, the Sunday you know, has ten pages of rugby in in today, and uh, Sunday Times uh, part eight pages, and um, of course we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, overlook either. Maybe it has been overlooked. The fact that the uh, Ireland under twenties are going for their Grand Slam later this afternoon as well. And um, there's uh, there's pieces. Uh, Brendan Fanning has a piece in the Sunday Indo preview in it, and I think uh, Peter O'Reilly yes as well in the in the Sunday Times. And uh, the Ireland under twenties, as you know, have done outstandingly outstandingly well to beat France and England away from home. And it looks like. Uh, they'll probably get the job done against Scotland today. Yeah, very much on track for that game at Musgrave Park at 5pm. More interested, the thing I've noticed, maybe this is a case of us being mentally scarred from what happened in the build-up to 2019 and Japan, where everyone was getting very giddy after the 2018 Grand Slam and then the November Internationals which followed and Ireland officially going to the top of the world rankings. There's a very mixed feeling about Ireland's campaign. Maybe that's because of some of the mixed performances where there was the good and bad mixed in, but even just taking a quick look through the way some of the writers are looking at this. So Brendan Fanning in the Sunday Independent is saying Farrell has still got plenty of work to do. Um, Neil Francis in the Sunday Times, Ireland saved their worst performance for last. He felt the Scotland uh, showing was the worst of the campaign. While Bernard Jackman, back in the Sunday Independent on page six, future looks exciting for a new look Ireland and he feels there's no reason that they can't push and try and get a Grand Slam and do well at the World Cup next year. Rory Best talking about the fact that Ireland weren't at their best but still got silverware. It seems expectations are being tempered a little bit here, Maura Trassa, after what will still feel like a fairly successful campaign given they won all the games bar one. Yeah, remember those halcyon days when we were top of the world rankings for that while and you actually thought, geez, Ireland might get beyond a quarterfinal this time and our hopes were cruelly, cruelly dashed. But I do think what's really interesting, Jim Goldilocks and the Three Bears and the porridge was too hot, too cold and just just right. I was looking today at the Sunday Times, the Sindo and the Mail on Sunday and to me, that was the epitome of it because we have the Sunday Independent which says, crowning glory, Ireland, Ireland finish on a high with a triple triumph. It is all yay, hurrah, Ireland is doing wonderfully. We have uh, the Sunday Times then saying Ireland beat Scotland to claim triple crown but France are champions and the headline is second best. The balloon is totally burst if you go by the Sunday Times. And then in the middle of it all then you have the Mail on Sunday which is silver linings. Ireland secure triple crown but Six Nations title goes to France. So that, to me I feel like that's the just right option. This is something Ireland would absolutely have been delighted with 20 years ago as we know they were. 
I think now as uh, rugby fans and actually anyone who plays rugby are mature enough to know as well that thankfully it appears that Ireland did not peak yesterday. And I think the best article out of all of the ones written today and there was a lot of really good reads like normally you'd skim through articles every one that most of the ones were written today were really you know worth giving your time to was uh, Bernard Jackman's one and um, I just thought that you know he really explained really really well why Ireland are playing the way they are how why sometimes our hearts are in our mouths watching them it's because this new kind of risk reward strategy which is why sometimes you're watching them and you're going oh my god no what are you doing with that and then sometimes it works out and you call it brilliant and other times you're thinking that was a silly move i mean if there was one thing under in, under, in the joe schmidt era is that ireland was predictable there still are slightly but not as much as they were and i think that's because farrell has been able to kind of do what leo cullen has managed to do with james lowe which is embrace the unpredictability and work it into a game plan and sometimes that means you're watching them through your through your through your fingers and other times you're thinking this is really great to watch so risk reward means they're not going to be predictable which means at the beginning of of a six nations campaign we didn't really know how they were going to do so i would say that in between it all yeah it was a good showing better than good decent very good and um, not excellent but the beauty of it is that i think everyone knows it and know that we're mature enough to expect more to come but we're also mature enough i think to understand that this takes time well, more trust with your sports psychologist hat on here. I would think back about Andy Farrell <laughs> last night at the press conference and he was asked like how he'd sum up the campaign in a more general sense. And he said, look, the idea was to try and win every single game, but they lost against France in Paris. They knew that their own fate was out of their hands then. And all they could do was get three bonus point wins to finish out the tournament. And ultimately, that's what they did. Uh, to use a phrase that's maybe overused, they control the controllables. They put up the maximum amount of points that they could after Paris. Absolutely. And I know it's a, it's an overused phrase, control the controllables. And it's so simple. But like we all know, people struggle with it. And we all know it in ourselves, in our own personal lives, professional lives, anyone involved in sport. You say, I'm going to control the controllables. The first controllable you can control every day is the time you get up in the morning. And how many of us fail at that very simple task? And then we're expecting 15 men to go out in the Stade de France and then recover from that when they lost, you know, or for example, or if they go to the Aviva with all the pressure that was on them yesterday, then again, against Scotland. And we know on paper, Ireland should have beaten Scotland, but that's not how sport works. So you're going out there, I'm controlling the controllables. And all of a sudden, this chaotic Scotland comes out against you, where they're looking at Scotland going, this is probably not how Ireland prepared for Scotland to play. And to be able to control their reaction to that, to control their emotions toward it, and to stick to their own game plan and see it out, because it wasn't a given. I know the scoreline at the end was quite flattering, but like to me, had Ireland not been at the races yesterday, Scotland could have caused trouble. But Ireland did stay at the races. But unfortunately... I suppose if we're going to stick with the racing metaphor, thinking we're in Shelton for the week anyway, like Ireland didn't come away with the Gold Cup. It doesn't matter when Aintree is coming around the corner, you know? That's the way, like if I'm to look at it, it wasn't perfect, but it was very good. And I think when you consider what Ireland were this time last year and the pool that Farrell had, there's still things. Like, for example, I would still like to see, for example, Johnny Sexton not being as relied upon as he is. I think that needs to change. And um, obviously, again, injuries and concussion protocols possibly took that out of Farrell's hands. But things like that. But there is time. And they have a great summer ahead from what it looks like. The schedule down, down in New Zealand and stuff is only going to help so long as it goes well. If it doesn't, we could be having a whole different discussion in high summer. Oh, I've got a feeling the conversation is going to be how many games should Joey Carberry play against the All Blacks mm. if he's going to be ready to be the backup out half in case anything happens to Jonathan Sexton in the last year of his rugby career uh, with him set to retire at the end of the next World Cup. It is an interesting point though raised by Bernard Jackman, Tommy, when it comes to Ireland moving away maybe from the shadow of... Joe Schmidt too because the whole idea was that Andy Farrell was meant to be a continuity appointment in many ways given that he was already working with the coaching team before Joe Schmidt announced that he was going to be finishing up but slowly but surely and particularly over the last calendar year and into this tournament he's been able to stamp his own imprint alongside Mike Cat on this team Yeah and uh, and uh, and create a, a team with their own identity uh, which we know is really important in the evolution of any team that they have their identity and for the first year of uh, Farrell's career, uh, time in charge it didn't it looked like they were muddling between maybe um, the <clears throat> legacy from Joe Schmidt's time and and at the start of uh, Andy Farrell's time and uh, <clears throat> and the fact that now they have an identity uh, and seems to have empowered them a lot and uh, uh, freed them up a lot liberated them and um, um, and let's let, let's you know 
I'm kind of torn uh, 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 with the comparison to Josh Mick because, um, albeit this um, this iteration of the team under Farrell is, is playing probably more attractive, uh, flamboyant rugby. Um, Joe Schmidt's teams gave us some of the best, gave Irish rugby some of the best days of their of of its history, and he was a formidably brilliant manager. And uh, we shouldn't. Uh, I, I hope we're not being too sort of quick to uh, um, uh, to hail a new regime as being somehow superior or better than or not uh, not not to do down the new regime, but just to acknowledge how brilliant and how great Schmidt was during his time in charge and the games they won and the performances they delivered and the memories he, he, he left us with. And I'm just mindful of that, uh, Will. And uh, while it's obviously wishing Andy Farrell and, and Paul O'Connell and everyone involved, you know, the best of luck, um, just, uh, you know, ultimately you might say they'll do well to emulate what Schmidt did, if uh, if uh, if not uh, surpass it. Yeah, we'd be foolish to forget this week four years ago, Ireland go to Twickenham and play champagne <clears> rugby <throat> against yeah. England and win a Grand Slam. It's only a very yeah. short time ago, and maybe our our memory of that period is somewhat affected by again the probably mental scarring of what happened a year and a bit on when they went to Japan to the World Cup yeah. and didn't yeah. deliver that type of performance again, particularly when they came up against uh, New Zealand in the quarterfinals and that game Great. against Japan yeah. in the pool. Um, but I think there is that kind of acceptance, Maura Trassa, now that there's. 11 games to play between now and going to France at the World Cup and that focus now very much has to be maybe less so on Ireland winning trophies after winning a triple crown this year and more so now on trying to get the preparations right for that World Cup especially given that France have announced themselves as the favourites for their World Cup on home soil Ah, oh, to have the confidence of the French that je ne sais quoi they're amazing really the way they do it but like I was listening to a discussion I was driving home one evening during the week and Joe Malloy was speaking to Brian O'Driscoll and they were talking about, you know, with this kind of talk about focusing on the World Cup and peaking at the right time, is there a chance that the Six Nations could possibly devalue it? Because they're all going on about, you know, Eddie Jones's psychological war games there about saying, ah, we don't care, but, you know, we're working toward the World Cup to kind of explain why England, why, why, why England had been so dismal. And I think Brian gave a very nuanced answer when he said, no, it, it's the Six Nations. It means a lot to us. Like There's a reason why, you know, the South Africans and people want to join into it. So I think there th- that discussion had kind of been happening during the week. You know, do we value it less? I don't think so. And like you said, there were great scenes only a few short years ago over in Twickenham. Maybe part of that, too, was because it happened in Twickenham. You know, we, we like that bit as well. But yeah, like I think as, as a rugby as, as a country who follows rugby, I think we do have to be cognizant that, you know, the World Cup matters too. It's not, and, and when it's happening, it, happen, it matters more than the Six Nations. When the Six Nations are happening, I think the Six Nations tend to matter more aside from the World Cup, or it did until very recently, whereas now we look at it kind of jaded and possibly a little bit injured from the last time around saying, ah, oh, yeah, but what's going to happen next? So I think what Andy Farrell has to do, he has to try and keep players fit. He has to try and phase out some of the more distinguished gentlemen. And he has to also try and bring in a more younger younger crop as well. And that's hard to do. That's that's conducting a symphony. And it's not easy to do. And it, Ireland hasn't really managed to do it yet. Um, they've gone close to it. And the Schmidt era was amazing for what they achieved. And it's very easy to pick faults afterwards when we look back on it. And we can see ah, the reason Schmidt's team didn't really didn't manage to perform on the big day was, one, there was plenty of time to analyse them in the years coming up to it we also knew how Ireland were going to play and it was that kind of real physicality game and once you began losing players to attrition and once people began to learn how to work your way around it it was a system that was folded that's too simplistic but that's that's how you would describe it when you look back on it at the moment we're looking at a team and we don't know how they're going to perform I can only hope that Andy Farrell knows how they're going to perform but I'm looking at it and I don't know. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but my inter- eternal optimist in me tells tells me that means, yeah, sure, look, there's way more exciting things to go. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's one of those things, it's tricky to evolve when you've got a winning team and when players are playing well. It's almost easier to clear the deck if you're in England scenario or Wales or Scotland where they've just had a disappointing campaign. And in Scotland's case, some of their key players breach of discipline last week. There's that argument to say, can Finn Russell be trusted? Maybe that's the reason we'll look to change things around. you got a team that's winning, it's far more difficult to say, well, mm-hmm. Johnny Sexton take a spell on the bench here uh, despite the fact you're our captain and a born winner yeah, for, 
for no reason aside from really ageism. Mm. When you think about it, you know, if he's performing <laughs> well, in really when you apply common sense to it, why would you put him on the bench? You know, like so, I totally get that that way as well. I can understand it. And Tommy, when it comes to the value of the competition, which Maura Trassa has mentioned already, there's not a huge amount of writing about Italy's dramatic win against Wales. I think that's understandable because I would say the papers were probably lined up as this was going to be either France collapse on the final day and Ireland win a championship or France are going to win and we assess how Ireland did. The writing on Italy will probably be a lot more in the days to come. But finally, they were able to snap that seven year, 36 games. There are some quotes carried in some of the papers from Kieran Crowley and uh, match reports about Cardiff. But mm. for an Italy team, who were at least being talked about being squeezed out of the championship potentially whether that be Georgia coming in or South Africa maybe being parachuted in Italy now have a strong case to say we should stay around after beating the Welsh on home soil um, You know I don't think one one uh, victory no, no matter how landmark it is um, uh, ought to erase um, so dismal what how many years like seven years or uh, 2015 I mean, in Rome against Scotland was their last win. Yeah, yeah, that's too much. Albeit, albeit, uh, 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 I thought that moment when they scored, I happened to be watching it live when when they scored the winning try was absolutely incredibly romantic and dramatic, and not least because this little magician Ange Capuazzo, um, uh, it it made it all the more endearing because he's so tiny. I mean, he is he he's he is the kind of the archetypal uh, kind of uh, uh, f- you know flyweight in a land of heavyweights, and uh, uh, it, it, it what it was a wonderful moment. I mean, we we still cynical and all as we may become, we still all love the the romance of the underdog of the David and Goliath, and and uh, but it was uh, added added to me for for that absolutely magical piece of uh, running, elusive, elusive running, uh, and the nerve of him too, a Capuazzo, to cut through the French cover and then do that fantastic sidestep uh, down the sideline and uh, and to play it back inside for the winning pass, for the winning try. It was one. It was wonderful. Um, I, I, overall, though, I, 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 Italy will need to do a lot more. And... <clears throat> If I might, we'll go back to the point you discussed with Mauro Trassa and the World Cup and that, and Brian O'Driscoll during the week. And I, I, I personally, I, I personally think rugby, the rugby itself, is doing itself a, a huge disservice by constantly deferring the conversation towards the next World Cup. It's incredibly tedious, I find, and I think it devalues their own what's happening season by season in between World Cups. I mean, the Six Nations. Is tournament is one of the great tournaments of world sport every year. Not just rugby, it's an absolutely wonderful tournament. And yet, I, I heard a pundit on on the radio uh, weeks ago when one of our, the Irish players got injured, and his first reaction was, "Oh, that's good because we can test out the next player in to see how he, would he be ready <clears throat> for the World Cup." I mean, there's this constant thing in in rugby of of waiting for tomorrow. Mm. All the time waiting for tomorrow, and it starts soon enough, you know, after the previous World Cup has ended. Well, and uh, get get ready for another year of us building towards. Now we have to take a break <laughs> to head towards the news, but okay. I guarantee you, the writing on Monday and all of the punditry and off the yeah. ball this week will be one year out from the World Cup. Where Ireland at? Here's Ireland's depth chart, etc., etc. Yeah. That's going to be the conversation. We'll be talking about the GPA, Rachel Blackmore, football, plenty more decides on the Sunday pay per view when we come back after the news at two. The Sunday papers on Off The Ball. On radio, on the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. Play News Talk. As a Sky VIP, I get the best treatment. I get exclusive deals like a discount on Sky Cinema. Whoa, whoa, that's my line. As I was saying, I, I get trials on apps like Discovery Plus and Fit. <laughs> Excuse me. I can get tickets to the biggest games, if you don't mind. And the longer you're a VIP, the better it gets. Guys, this is my job. At Sky, everyone's a VIP. Okay, fine, go for it. Sky, believe in better. 
Tickets allocated in a ballot. 18 plus. See sky.com slash VIP terms. Dundeal has the largest range of electric vehicles in Ireland from Ireland's trusted premium car dealerships. That's why you will find Spirit Volvo on Dundeal. Stop by Spirit Volvo on Dundeal today and connect with them for great deals on electric vehicles. Dundeal. For electric vehicle deals to feel great about from all of Ireland's trusted car dealerships. Mum's lost in an ancient chateau. Little Neve sprinting down sandy beaches. And Danny fixated on the ferry full Irish. Dream of France your way from the spacious WB8 with Irish ferries. Then drive off relaxed and ready to go. Book at irishferries.com. Deposit just €200. Euro. Irish ferries. See travel differently. T's and C's apply. CompuB has upgraded. Select is the new name for your local Apple expert. A next level experience from the same great crew. Offering the full Apple range with training, repairs, tech support and more. Buy any iPhone, iPad or Mac and get a three year extended warranty, seven day tech support and a training course worth up to €339 Euro on us. Only at Select. See what our knowledge can do for you. Visit us in store or online at selectonline.com. Terms and conditions apply. Rediscover the joy of the train. On board, you can relax, listen to music from the popular hit parade, or simply gaze out one of the many windows. Yes, it's all fun and games on the train with great fares at irishrail.ie. Ian Road Aaron, part of the Transport for Ireland network. We look forward to welcoming you to our Plaza Motorway service stations. Quality food and four courts with Supermax, Papa John's, Super Subs, Bewley's Barista, Max Place Deli and Spar. Come for the fuel, stay for the food. The Plaza Group, the perfect pit stop on your journey. Now open at the Port Leash Plaza. This is a UNICEF emergency appeal. Over 7 million children in Ukraine are facing a humanitarian crisis. Our dedicated teams have been working in Ukraine for 25 years. Right now, they are on the ground providing clean water, winter kits and medical supplies. But we need your support. Please go to unicef.ie to donate now. That's unicef.ie to help protect children in Ukraine. Thank you. Move to Air Prepay today and get supersonic 5G speeds at no extra cost with Ireland's best 4G and 5G network availability. Plus, for a limited time only, with every €20 Euro top-up, get no limits 5G data with unlimited calls and unlimited texts. Go in store or visit air.ie. Air. Let's make possible. Subject to €20 Euro top-up every 28 days. Moving your number to Air and fair usage. Offer ends March 31st. For full terms, see air.ie. Lunchtime Live. On Lunchtime Live this week, we want to settle the age-old debate. To bean or not to bean, what's better, the Ulster or Irish fry? Three sausages, three rashers, two hash browns, two fried eggs, some beans and some mushrooms, toast and tea. And then if you're hungry, maybe some... Uh, hungry? Fr- French, <laughs> this? French toast Feed. and chips afterwards as well. Jesus, I tell you, two <laughs> rennies you'd want after that. <laughs> Lunchtime Live with Andrea Gilligan. Brought to you by Avant Money. Weekdays at midday on News Talk. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm JJ Clark. Events are taking place around the country today as part of a National Day of Remembrance. The nation is paying tribute to the more than 6,600 people who died from COVID-19, as well as the efforts of workers, volunteers and the public over the last two years. There is National Commemoration Ceremony in the Garden of Remembrance in North Dublin this afternoon. Tanis de Leo Varadkar will attend in place of Michal Martin, who contracted COVID-19 in Washington. The local council in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol says an art school which was sheltering 400 people has been bombed. The city's mayor also says people are being forced to evacuate to Russian cities. Although this hasn't been verified, it's a claim that is recognised by Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Olga Stefanishnia. It has been recognised as absolutely a nonsense to evacuate people to the territory of the country who has started the aggression on Ukrainian territory. So now they do it forcefully. Police in in the north are appealing for witnesses after a man was stabbed in South Belfast. Detectives say the man was stabbed in an alleyway between Damascus Street and Jerusalem Street at around 2.15 yesterday afternoon by a man who was dressed in a navy dressing gown. 
It's claimed P&O Ferries is paying new staff under the minimum wage. Earlier this week, 800 permanent employees at the company were told they were being made redundant with no notice. The RMT, a union representing maritime and transport workers in the UK, say vessels were going to be manned by Russian and Ukrainian crews. Mick Lynch is the union's, union's secretary general. They're now turning to Filipino, Indonesian and Indian crews and people will be paid as little as $3.47 in American dollars per hour for work in those shifts. That is just disgusting on a moral level. Pope Francis has described the war in Ukraine as an unjust, justified, senseless massacre. He told tens of thousands of people in St. Peter's Square at his weekly Sunday address that everyday slaughters and atrocities are being perpetrated. It's two minutes past two. News talk weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Scrap the flowers this Mother's Day and give her a Ryanair gift card instead. This afternoon, sunny in the east and northeast with cloudier conditions elsewhere. Rain and drizzle in the Midlands will fizzle out later and it will be mainly dry with highest temperatures of 9 to 13 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Welcome back. Just to bring you up to speed on some of the scores currently in the Allianz Hurling League to start with. Westmead have qualified for the Division 2 final where they will play against Down. Westmead winning by a goal and 21 points to 14 points against Kildare. That was a half 12 throw in. 16 minutes gone between Kilkenny and Waterford. Waterford very much on course to qualify for the semi-finals. Two places up for grabs in Division 1B today. The day shall lead against Kilkenny at Nolan Park by 7 points to 4. Uh, Dublin will need a big victory if they're to qualify but they lead against Leash currently by 5 Five points to three. A uh, Galway against Clare. Both teams just prepping for championship now because the top two is already decided in Division 1A. It's Galway three points, Clare three points. And a goal from Conor McDonald has Wexford leading against Cork. Both these teams bound for the last four. Wexford lead against Cork by one goal and three points to two points. Elsewhere, it is Limerick four points, awfully two. Limerick need to avoid defeat in that one if they are to miss out on the relegation playoff against Antrim. And in the football in England currently, Leicester against Brentford the Premier League uh, three minutes gone no goals there as yet uh, QPR now trail against Peterborough by three goals to one in the Championship and Crystal Palace lead against Everton by two goals to nil in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup about 12 minutes left in that one delighted to say uh, that Tommy Conlon and Maura Trask and Nick Callagher are still with us we're looking through the Sunday papers we're moving from the rugby which dominated many of the papers today to the GEA GPA and also the collapse of Cork we're all bundling them together into one piece here really but uh, to start off with the GPA um, Tom I mean, there's a lot of writing about this, including in uh, your own paper in the Sunday Independent. Colm O'Rourke, uh, GPA need to avoid double standards, uh, following on from his comments on the TV on League Sunday last week about the idea of potentially unlimited training sessions for players and uh, the fees that the GPA are looking to get in expenses. And Joe Brawley is saying professional imposter has been hiding in plain sight. Again, the idea that the GPA are trying to usher in semi-professionalism for GEA players. Now, there's the opposite point of view in the Daily Mail, which we'll talk about in a moment as well, on page 66 of that paper, Mark O'Shea saying that players make the GA and that they should be valued and paid their expenses for preparing for games. Uh, but Colin O'Rourke and Joe Brawley particularly coming out quite strongly on the GPA today in the Sunday Independent, Tommy. Yeah, uh, I felt um, I felt the, there were a few cheap shots taken at the GPA in some of the comments there. Um I, I, as it happens, I, I, I remember when the uh, GPA was founded in '99. I, I covered that story at the time, and uh, I remember being up at a press conference in uh, Belfast when uh, Desi Farrell uh, was there, and um, Donal, um, what's his name? It was, sorry, my apologies. His name forgets me. Uh, name eludes me now. Donal O'Keefe. Uh, uh, no, yeah, Donald Oak was involved at the, uh, but um, this lad was in, had been in uh, with Mark McCormack's sports agency. Um, Donald was, I think he's from County Down. Yes, yeah, Donald O'Neill, uh, I think, is it? Donald O'Neill, yeah. thanks, Will, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I, what, what I remember at that time was that um, the chances of the GPA ever getting off the ground seemed so limited at the time. They seemed it seemed at the time, and Crow Park treated it at the time as just another sort of players' rebellion that would wither away within a few weeks. Because going back to the 80s, if not the 70s, there had been intermittent attempts by players to try and come together and um, 
uh, organise together for uh, better treatment. And um, clear, and but all of those efforts had just been faded away very quickly. And and I, I remember at the time the scepticism that this one would would last either. And um, and at that time and prior in the seventies and eighties and through into the nineties. Players had been treated abysmally, by and large, with some honourable exceptions. I mean, as soon as the player got a serious injury, he was more or less abandoned by everyone. And, and um, you know, he might get his expenses, his medical expenses paid maybe months and months and months later, if at all. And um, go training, no food, um, no hot food, back to Dublin or wherever they were that night. And... Um, it was uh, in terms of gear and, and proper training gear and everything like that. It was all just they, they, they kind of were treated like serfs a bit in general, uh, patronised and lionised when they were winning things or going well. But um, I, I remember vividly, I mean, how disposable players are. And the GPA, against all odds at the time, survived and prospered and thrived and it ha- has now become part of the landscape of uh, Irish sport of Gaelic games in this country and the fact that Desi Farrell, Donald O'Neill and the, those other founders and people in the first few years of it managed to build something out of nothing is a huge achievement and nowadays uh, players are being looked after really, really well. And I don't mean just in terms of the county board looking after their expenses, albeit that's part of it. It's just in general, the more holistic thing, helping a player on a career path, an academic path, you know, a business path, you know, uh, for uh, for uh, counselling, for uh, help if they've got mental health problems or addiction issues. Um, the GPA provides generally uh, an outstanding, a really progressive, positive a really outstanding service, it seems to me anyway, and certainly in comparison to what was there before it. So I have a I have an underlying sympathy and respect for what for what they have done in the last twenty years. He, 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 parking the specifics of this of this particular issue that's flared up at the moment, you know, and. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of my view, and I am well disposed to them for what they've achieved and what they offer players to this day. Hmm. Maura Trassel, when it comes to this, there's kind of two or three different strands to the conversation. And maybe some of this comes from Tom Parsons' comments last weekend, where it maybe wasn't defined on League Sunday that Tom Parsons wasn't looking for unlimited training sessions for players. And automatically the narrative kind of switched to, well, if the GPA are to care about the players who are in their association they should be looking after their welfare and ensuring that these players aren't overtrained and being overtrained by management teams and therefore they're looking for expenses for an unlimited amount of sessions per week and then as the week went on the conversation went around capping training sessions back to three and they'd be paid for but ultimately at the heart of this the issue that kind of gets forgotten is that the issue the players have is trying to restore the levels of mileage back to what they were pre-pandemic and trying to restore them at a time when inflation is rife and you look at how much it costs to actually put diesel into your car currently. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I'm very familiar with that feeling at the moment, I say, like everyone is. Um, now, do we blame Tom Parsons for that now, the fact that we didn't have those nitty-gritty details last Sunday night, or do we blame the people who he was sharing the platform with who went very emotive a la Colm O'Rourke? And I understand Colm O'Rourke's position, but that's his own personal position. And I feel that maybe... He did a very good job of maybe ensuring that Tom wasn't heard or what Tom was trying to say wasn't heard. Um, I think Michael Dignan, if anyone really wants to know what's going on, Michael Dignan has a really good piece today in the Mail on Sunday where he actually explains when training starts, how much the county board pays, how much Croke Park gives, how much is agreed and goes through how they get their expenses. And I think he has a really good line. It's just the one line and it's so simple. And it, But if a county is being run properly, there should be very little need for the GPA. As Tommy has alluded to there, there was a time 
And I know it still happens in some places around the country where players were not even second class citizens. They were just treated like if you were useful and if you were handy, you were great. And once you weren't of use anymore to your county or your management, you were thrown on the scrap heap. It didn't matter what the hell was going on. And I think the Mail on Sunday actually does a really good job of covering this in lots of different facets. Because then when you turn the page, Philip Lanigan has a really good interview with uh, Charlie Carter, Mm. where, you know, we all know how Kilkenny have been supreme for so long. And from what I can see, from my dipping in and out of the Kilkenny camp over the years at, you know, press conference, not that you'd hear much anyway, but you know what I mean. From what I can see, it was a settled county run well by a county board. And Charlie Carter explains how, you know, there was one time he was under pressure. He was a farmer and there was lambing going on at home and he was finding it very difficult to get to training and also do the lambing. And that was creating stress in his life. And he went to Ned Quinn and Ned Quinn said, you know, it would help maybe having a farm hand to help you over these busy few weeks. It didn't cost Kilkenny much, but it meant that Charlie Carter was able to go and play hurling. And a lot of this boils down to common sense and a lack of common sense. And then there's a lot of emotion around it for some reason. So you turn the page again, two more pages, and Mark O'Shea has a really good piece where he talks about meeting a Kerry supporter who was enraged by the topic. And I wonder, was he just enraged because he saw somebody being quite enraged on the TV the night before and everyone's knee-jerk reactions, you know? Like, what's wrong with the GPA? Are they trying to tell us that four sessions a week isn't enough? Who in their right mind trains five times a week, he bellowed? Well, I did, and so did the rest of our lads, is what Mark O'Shea points out. In cue silence, and my man looks at me as if I had two heads, I think perhaps down in the deep south, there's still a romanticised view that footballers are born, not coached or really trained. A bit like how the Spanish see the English sizzling in the afternoon sun, there might be a view that only madmen or Ulster footballers would ever contemplate training five times a week. And we all know the reality is different. I think Michael Dygan has done a very good job of explaining what that reality is. And I think as well, perhaps the GPA could have done a better job of explaining why they were looking for these expenses. Now, in fairness, I did hear Tom Parsons say last Sunday, some weeks there might only be training twice a week, some weeks there might be four or five. But you have old school thinkers who think that what the hell are they doing training five, six nights a week? They're not. I have been in inter-county setups. I know what it's like. You might There might be demands of your time. Like, for example, one of those nights might be a recovery session. But if you live in one end of the county and you're being asked to do recovery at the other end of the county, that is costing you money. Now, again common sense should prevail in this i mean it should be a more holistic approach look at that player and see is there anywhere this this guy can do it somewhere closer to home as an example i just feel like it just went nuclear very very fast when it didn't have to and to be fair as well to gaa during the week you know they 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 were talking about you know there was a charter that hadn't been agreed upon and as a result there was delays in payment they then create a facility that people could get paid. And I know for a fact, I do know this, people have been paid this week. So it just comes back again to communication, doesn't it? And a lack, there is there is a disconnect for sure between the normal punter who pays in who pays their club membership every year and what goes on at the highest level. And most people understand this and they're happy with that. But there are some people who just hark back to halcyon days we are talking about earlier in the rugby Life moves on. And if you want players to only train twice a week and to do it for the love of the game, one, you're not going to have them. Two, you certainly won't have the best. Three, you'll have more injuries. You will have more problems. And we won't be enjoying what we're watching on TV. So all those things come into the mix of it. And it's not simple, but I think Michael has done the best of it. And I think a point that'd be worth remembering as well is that, you know, for, at the moment, it's, I think it's 32 people who are who are technically allowed onto a squad. We all know that doesn't work for modern inter-county hurling and football for training sessions. So most squads are bigger than that. There's 38, 40 plus in a lot of them. And the county board pays for that in those cases. So it just comes back to getting better at keeping your house in order and looking after people. And I don't know. I just think it didn't have to go the way it did. It's a pity it did. Hopefully it would be a storm in a teacup and will die down again and let nobody's out of pocket. But of course... If you want to widen it out again a bit more, we're talking about all these people not being out of pocket where we're seeing women in counties up and down the country who really are playing for the pleasure because they ain't getting anything. Well, and that's a bigger question. Just on that point, Maura and we'll wrap it back around to the, to the GPA again in a moment, but something that stuck out to me, both Division 1 ladies football semi-finals for the league were on yesterday and there was the concluding round of the Camogie League. There's actually very little coverage in the papers when you consider there was very little mm-hmm. live sport on yesterday with the Six Nations. Absolutely. I mean, I actually noticed I was going through the papers and I said to myself, wow, there's more than what I'd normally see. I actually did notice that. But I also noticed, for example, Darrow Krupp who wrote copy from the Galway to Prairie Camogie game that ended in very controversial circumstances. And his report was the one that was the theme all the way through. So people were taking the copy from the one person. I'm glad it was there. We could have had more. We had two very good semi-finals yesterday. 
Um, now, what does this have to do with mileage people be saying? Well, what it has to do with it is the more people you get in through the turnstiles, the more money LGFA and Camogie Association will have, which means at some point it becomes viable for the WGPA, who aren't technically the WGPA anymore, who are now going in under the GPA to say, hold up. And I know this because, again, from working in intercounty backroom teams, women's teams, what they have to do is they have to create their own kind of arrangement with every county board, which means it is not a level playing field, which means some women in some counties are getting some kind of reimbursement. It might even be as simple as getting a diesel voucher, which as we know now these days is worth its weight in gold anyway. But there are some people in other counties not getting anything. So when you're trying to create a playing field that people can go and watch the games and enjoy the games, you can see, you can understand then why the teams in the lower divisions are finding it difficult to climb their way up, Meath being a notable exception. Because it's not level and it's not fair. So remember that little lad with the girls playing up the hill. It, it, the same problems permeate in women's sport as well that do in men's. And then you're thinking it can't just be money, can it? It has to be holistic. Because, for example, we all know Carlo will not have the funds of, say, a Tyrone. And I know it's not just money that helps you win, but it helps. So it's it's bigger than expenses and it's bigger than just resenting some lad getting money for driving to training we have to we talk about you know that welfare thing that uh, study that was done by the esri a few years ago actually my own master's thesis from ul fed into that there were players i spoke to were overwhelmed they were stressed out they found it very difficult trying to balance it all i think it's getting better i think as well though it comes to coaching education and back to county boards again county boards need to be able to put the brakes on if some coaches in saying people need to be doing this training we know now recovery is as important as training and the top teams aren't doing mental training five, six, seven nights a week. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work because it won't work. Tommy, this might become one of the wider debates around this too, even if it wasn't the intended consequence of the discussion on League Sunday last week, is that the idea that players may well be overburdened and overtraining, because I know from talking to some professional athletes, they can't believe the amount of training sessions that amateur athletes in Gaelic games actually take part in when recovery is so much more important for players who are in professional sport. Particularly speaking to some professional rugby players, they couldn't understand mm. the amount of collective sessions that GA teams were actually doing. Well, are, 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 just to ask you, Will, are those professional players you spoke to, are they not training every day, every morning? Well, most of them are meeting up. It was professional provincial level players that I would have spoken yeah. to who played a bit of GA when they were younger and then switched okay. across they were saying that they have just have a much more defined routine in what they do in that they're not going to work a job so if they have to go and do weight sessions or mm. a collective pitch session maybe two or three days a week during the week they're in rest and recovery outside of that and that generally the actual contact that they would have with each other for training sessions would be a lot less than they would have had when they were playing maybe underage GA before they focused on rugby. That that surprised me a bit. But then on the other hand, it didn't surprise me, Tommy, because with the GA, there seems to be a slight culture of trying to keep up with the Joneses, where there's this idea that if the Limerick hurlers and the Dublin footballers are doing this many sessions and they're putting this amount of work in, if we're going to close the gap, they go five days, we got to go six. If they're going to train mm. for four hours in the evening, we'll do five. It seems to be certainly something that's linked into GA culture. Yeah, that's true, Will. There's always been this sort of element of the arms race about it. I mean, going back to the really to the 1970s when Kevin Heffernan uh, was deemed to have revolutionised um, the physical training preparation uh, of his Dublin team in 1973, 1974, and then uh, Mick O'Dwyer, young and new into the Kerry management team, rec immediately recognised that uh, they had to uh, overhaul and, and hugely bring up their training regime to match the dubs. And uh, it became then a uh, self-perpetuating sort of arms race. And all counties got on board, or most of them eventually in the years that followed. And it pertains to this day. My understanding of it, uh, and here's where I am out of touch, uh, I could be accused of being out of touch, but is that, that it's not quite as brutal, uh, the, the, the training sessions as they used to be in the 90s. I mean... Um, um, for example, when John O'Mahony was in charge of the Leitrim boys in the early 1990s and won the uh, 94 Connor title with them, the training sessions they did were absolutely brutal. And uh, my understanding is that, you know, fast forward 15, 20 years and and that the regimes are, are more customised, more uh, calibrated, uh, more scientifically measured. And uh, and there's prehab and there's uh, as Maura Trassa said the rest of recovery thing and that that there's gen that 
they have the culture has come to recognize that uh, sometimes less is more and uh, so i i i can't really offer you a comment will on whether they're doing too much now uh, uh, or or has it been has it been suitably moderated to take into account rest and recovery uh, and all like that and even and anyway, we may well be generalising, and, and in some counties with some managers, they may just have a nicely calibrated amount of quantity of work versus quality of uh, rest and recovery. And uh, uh, so I, I don't know, and I really can't offer a view on that. Uh, but um, just to reiterate what uh, Maura Trasta said about Michael Dygan, that this is the best piece today to explain the current impasse between the GPA and, and the GA, because Michael himself is chairman of the Offaly County Board, former player. He's right, in at the, he's right at the core face in terms of dealing with players' expenses, player welfare, player needs. And I, I think that that's, uh, this, that's the article you'll go to for really your information and the substance of the issue as as we're currently discussing it today. Yeah, it definitely holds a lot of weight because Michael Dygan has been at the coalface and is able to give examples yeah. of, of what's happened and how the structures work around payments and uh, making the point that really this impasse should come to an end, at least uh, with regard to the expenses, because the government have now agreed to go up to that for a certain amount of sessions per week. Uh, so it seems maybe an end is in sight. That exact word, impasse, reached with GA and GPA at odds over training sessions uh, from Christy O'Connor in the Sunday Times today on page 17. But I know Christy O'Connor's piece on the other side of this uh, double spread caught your eye Maura Trassa where he's talking about Cork's footballers who are in a right relegation mire at the moment in Division 2 of the Football League Yeah um, I, I, I actually really enjoyed it as a piece it was kind of explaining the character of Keith Ricken and Tea and Toast and basically he just looks at the problem that's ahead of him deals with that and then moves on to the next thing and um yeah, it's just a really good article that explains, I mean, we, we think about Cork football now, the first word that comes into all our heads is transition. And by Japers, how many years do you need to transition? Especially in Cork, when he, he lanes out, you know, that they've more, they have so many more clubs, like for example, size and potential. There are 47 more clubs in Cork than there are in the entire province of Connacht. There are more football clubs in Cork than the whole of Munster. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I think hard questions are being asked of Cork at the moment. And I think the likes of Keith Ricken now is dealing with the short end of the, the, the straw, so to speak, because he's the one dealing with the products in front of him. But I just thought it was really interesting. He's a really nice opener. He said he's talking about when Keith Ricken was sick. He was in hospital. He had a colonoscopy. And then the doctor was giving him some, you know, some very hard hitting results as well as described here. His wife and children were in the room at the time when the doctor asked if he had any questions. His kids had just eaten his toast. Rickon was starving. Is there any chance, he asked the doctor, that I could get more tea and toast? On the journey home, Rickon's wife asked why his first reaction to bad news was to ask for food. He said that satiating his hunger was the most important thing to him at that particular time. So when he shared the story then when he was working with the Cork under 20s in 2019, his message was simple. The next obstacle is all that matters. We hark back earlier to control the controllables. And he's talking about with a soft goal, which originated from a short kick out, put Dublin ahead by nine points after just 11 minutes of that year's All-Ireland final. A Cork defender ran into goalkeeper Josh O'Keefe. Tea and toast, he said, next kick out. So Cork now, if you're going to take the tea and toast uh, metaphor here and look at them, you know, I know they're playing in Cork Park this afternoon. I don't know how that game is going, but they're I did see They're leading by three earlier. points at the moment, Cork. Are they? Yeah, there they you go, tea and toast. 110 to 17. So, the, the tea and toast is nice and warm for Cork at the moment, unless, you know, something happens in, in the meantime. But I saw Tony Lean. I didn't see who he retweeted. He retweeted somebody there and he put up a picture of the stand in Porky Cueve. He said, you know, guess the supporters, count the, count the number of supporters. There was It was a very, very poor attendance. And it's chicken and egg. Why would you go to a game, I suppose, when you're not expecting much out of it? But what has gone wrong in Cork? Like, and there's no answer to it. Mm. Um, it's like he goes through as well about how last year for the first time ever, you know, they weren't they went looking for outsiders to apply for the job. And um, the Cork football job had always looked ideally suited. Uh, Christy writes here for an outsider with no agendas to come in and tear up the scripts. A few applied, but the big name candidates the board were looking for didn't bite. The board did still speak to some of those big names, but nothing materialised. Rickon's a popular character within the county, but he and his entire management team have never worked at senior level before. Now, why is that a bad thing? You know, and I'm not saying Christie's saying it is, but you can tell there obviously was some unease in Cork that he might be the man to be appointed to the job. Think back to just a few short months ago when, you know, he did a really great post-match interview on TG Gad about, you know, just take the, when you when you have the good days, take them, soak it in, enjoy it. Tea and toast again, I suppose. And there were some people saying, oh, if I was from Cork now, I wouldn't be that that kind of optimistic or that happy about it. Well, jeepers, didn't he have reason to soak in the joy when he could? 
I mean, I don't know how today's going to pan out now. I mean, Cork and Down, what is it, 12 years ago they were in the All-Ireland final? Yeah, it's remarkable. I think they're now both scrapping and people in Down have almost accepted that they're going down to Division 3. But 12 minutes to go, Cork up by three points. So maybe Cork are going to pull off the great escape. Uh, they still have to go to Offaly, one of the teams who are in the relegation battle on the last day. But mm -hmm. it adds that bit of excitement to Division 2. I mean, there's two big counties who are trying to fight at the moment uh, to make sure they don't go into Division 3. Yeah, absolutely. And... Christy makes the the um, the point here. They aren't hard to beat. Um, Galway went down a few weeks ago in a really high scoring game and managed to win. Um, so you feel with Cork, maybe it's the Corkness, but you always feel there's an opportunity for resurrection there. But I think definitely, I know the questions are being asked in Cork. I think maybe we who stand by and watch and just, I think we're happy. And there seems to be so many other GAA stories and that because Cork is so strong in hurling and ladies football and camogie as well, that we're kind of nearly saying, oh, look, Cork, that's football. You know, it's a hurling county. It's ruined the football. We have probably haven't asked the questions we should have. So I think Christy O'Connor's piece is a really good thought-provoking piece. And it kind of makes me like Keith Rick and more. I, I, I've never met the man, but you kind of like the guy from his interviews and it just kind of makes you root for him. So you just hope that it's a project that no matter how Cork go, that he is the better for it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he was very interesting on the uh, BBC GA podcast a few weeks back as well when uh, Cork were up to play against, uh, they were up in Derry, I think, to play in the mm. uh, Football League and he popped across to the BBC and had about an hour long chat with them, which is a very good, interesting listen as well. Uh, coming up, we'll be talking about Rachel Blackmore's coverage in Shelton this week in the Sunday Papers. And we'll look at the football. There's uh, plenty about Chelsea and their takeover, which is being assessed by the UK government with the potential bidders now in after the deadline. And the Republic of Ireland squad and Stephen Kenny his comments after he named it. We'll talk about all that after this short break. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Lunchtime Live. On Lunchtime Live this week, we want to settle the age old debate to bean or not to bean. What's better, the Ulster or Irish fry? Three sausages, three rashers, two hash browns, two fried eggs, some beans and some mushrooms, toast and tea. And then if you're hungry, maybe some... Uh, hungry? French, <laughs> After this? French toast Feed. and chips afterwards as well. Jesus, I tell you, two <laughs> rennies you'd want after that. <laughs> Lunchtime Live with Andrea Gilligan. Brought to you by Avant Money. Weekdays at midday on News Talk. In these troubling times, worries and problems can become magnified, making it difficult to cope. At HelpLink Mental Health, we are here to help by offering free or low-cost counselling support seven days a week and out of hours. All HelpLink services are available nationwide, from free counselling for gambling addiction to low-cost, general, youth, addiction, couples and bereavement counselling. So if you or someone you know needs support right now, talk to us at helplink.ie. Are you ready to quit smoking? Stop smoking for 28 days and you're five times more likely to quit for good. But you don't have to wait a month for benefits. Within days, you'll feel improvements in your taste, sense of smell, sleep, energy, and your lungs start to repair. And after 28 days, it only gets better. For your free quit plan, visit quit.ie or free phone 1800 201 203. Start your 28-day quit journey this March and make the next stop your last stop. From the HSE. New from Go Loud, Unusual Suspects tells the incredible tale of the 1993 Rochester Brinks heist. You can see the stacks of money bulging through the nylon. We'll hear the inside story of the FBI's investigation into the $7.4 million robbery. FBI are watching it 24 hours a day. The Irish priest of Manhattan, the IRA man turned comic book dealer, and an ex-cop. In order to be one of them, you have to be a pathological liar. Subscribe now to Unusual Suspects. A Go Loud original. Get €100 Euro off your bill when you switch to Air's Totally Unlimited Fibre Broadband. Our strongest, most reliable broadband connection straight to the heart of your home. For just €34.99 a month, stream the latest movies, game to your heart's content, and download your favourite music. To get €100 Euro off, call 1-800-500-300, go in store, or visit air.ie before March 31st. Air. Let's make possible. Subject to availability, pricing refers to Air Gigabit Fiber 500 Meg. For full terms and conditions, go to air.ie forward slash gigabit fiber. Looking to treat your mum to something personal this Mother's Day? You can now add your own special touch to the iconic Dunstores e-gift card. Choose a photo of mum or select a snap of someone she loves, whether it's you, a family member or even her furry friend. Upload your photo and we'll add it to her e-gift card, which she can use online across fashion, food and homeware. Buy and send a personalised e-gift card at any time or schedule it to arrive on Mother's Day. Dunn's stores, always better value. Terms and conditions, exclusions and minimum spend applies. 
Are you looking for an affordable alternative to a nursing home or private visiting care service? AL Home Care are the live-in care specialists that give your loved ones the independence they deserve. Contact us today at alhomecare.ie. That's alhomecare.ie. We may never work in the same way again. So reimagine the office with scalable workspaces that flex to your needs. Design-led interiors and world-class IT. Iconic offices have reinvented the future of working, so you don't have to. Hybrid offices, co-working, or custom floors for a global HQ. 16 prime Dublin locations, infinite possibilities. Experience it for yourself. Visit iconicoffices.ie to reimagine how working can work for your business. Rediscover the joy of the train. On board, you can peruse a periodical, take an executive nap, or connect to the World Wide Web with complimentary onboard Wi-Fi. Yes, the train is just the ticket for today's busy executive with great fares at irishrail.ie. Ian Road Aaron, part of the Transport for Ireland network. This is a UNICEF emergency appeal. Over 7 million children in Ukraine are facing a humanitarian crisis. UNICEF teams are on the ground providing clean water, winter kits and medical supplies. But we need your support. Please go to unicef.ie to donate now and help protect children in Ukraine. Thank you. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. It's now half-time in Division 1B of the Alliance National Hurling League between Kilkenny and Waterford. The Cats looking to get a win to seal their place in the semi-finals of the competition. Let's get a half-time report from Kilkenny from Dahi Boland. Half-time here at Nolan Park and it's Kilkenny who lead 1-10, Waterford 11 points. Killian Buckley with the Kilkenny goal in the 25th minute to level the game 1-7 to 10 at the time. Waterford had started this game brighter, leading by four points at one stage in the opening 10. All the Dacia forwards have scored, while for Kilkenny, Podrick Walsh with three and Walter Walsh with two points have impressed. Half-time, Kilkenny 1-10, Waterford 11. The other half-times in the Hurling League, these games started at 145 Galway and Clare it is Galway leading by two points at the break 14 points to 12 a Tipperary lead against Antrim a real goal fest from the Premier in the first half they lead against an Antrim team managed by their former goalkeeper Darren Gleeson by 5 10 to 13 points a Dublin lead on the road against Leash by 21 points to one goal and 12 it is Wexford 113 Cork 8 points both those teams have already qualified for the semis from 1A and it looks like Limerick will be staying up the All-Ireland champions they lead against Offaly at the break at the the Gaelic grounds by 116 to 10 points. Now, Castagna has given Leicester the lead against Brentford in the Premier League by one goal to nil. That game is coming up on the half hour. But in the FA Cup, Crystal Palace are going back to Wembley. Uh, they've won quite comfortably in their game against Everton. Let's go across to Nigel Bidmead. Crystal Palace 4, Everton 0. Wembley beckons for Crystal Palace after they cruise to victory over Premier League strugglers Everton in this FA Cup quarter-final tie. The visitors made a strong start but had no response after skipper Mark Gurhey headed Palace in front from a corner on 25. Just before the interval, Abiri Eze and Will Zaha combined for Jean-Philippe Mateta to finish first time. Palace controlled the second half and scored a third on 79, Will Zaha popping home a rebound and a fourth on 87 when substitute Will Hughes did the same. Palace 4, Everton 0. Yeah, really mixed week for Everton that win against Newcastle huge for them in the Premier League uh, but now getting hammered by Crystal Palace in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup we'll talk about the other FA Cup quarterfinals a little bit later on in the programme we are looking at the football from the Sunday papers Tommy Conlon and Maura Trasna Kelly are still with me um, Maura Trasna I'll give you first shout on the football because I really enjoyed Rob Draper and Nick Harris have got a two page spread in the Daily Mail on Sunday about the bidders for Chelsea because this all yes. happened pretty quickly during the week where four or five bids all had to be in by Friday uh, we had some of the bids talking about it some of them were keeping reason be quiet the UK government now have to make a decision on it uh, but they've all been profiled which is very very handy for anyone who wants a quick explainer on the would-be owners of Chelsea next week for sure and you're going through the profiles wondering which one is less problematic but I also love you know, let's just throw in a John Terry joke while we're here. Like, so there's a big two-page spread here over, you know, who the bidders are. And right at the bottom is Terry, I'll protect history. Even here, he pokes his head in and gets himself into a place where perhaps he had no business being in an article, just in a quick John Terry way. But they go through the, and they have a little infographic here. So you've got one, two, three, four, five different bidders that they've profiled. The Ricketts family, Team Bowley, and they seem to possibly be the be the front runners. They were the ones obviously who who they own, the LA Dodgers and the LA Lakers. Uh, the Broughton bid, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that properly. This guy was a former chairman of British Airways and briefly 
Liverpool as mm. well. Um, Blue Football Consort- Consortium, and that is run by Nick Candy, who people might not know of him, but they might know of his wife. She is Holly Valance. Did she sing that song, Kiss Kiss? She was on Neighbours back oh, in the day. Don't even well, pretend you didn't know more, Tosh. So you know <laughs> your, uh, your pop culture and your pop history here. You knew full well where you were going yeah. with that. Oh, come on now, in fairness, my last concert was One Direction. Of course I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one profiled is the Saudi Media Group. And that bid is run by, uh, the bid leader is Mohammed al Khadshari. He is 50 years old. He is Saudi Arabian and he studied in London and apparently a long time um, Chelsea fan. I love the way there's a profile underneath asking, are they good for the money? And underneath here is like, he is a billionaire. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> But Tommy, the interesting thing is about the Saudi bid which comes in and they were very quick to point out that they're not linked with the Saudi government but that was exactly the same line with the investment fund which came in to buy Newcastle. Is the Premier League going to be under tremendous pressure if they're looking at that bid from Saudi Arabia given Saudi Arabia and Yemen's situation currently? If they're going to freeze the assets of a Russian oligarch and effectively make him pass the club on without a profit, if they end up going from Roman Aramovich to a Saudi bid the Premier League are going to have some serious questions asked about them aren't they? Yeah and I mean they have serious questions to answer anyway irrespective I mean I mean if if a saint came down out of heaven and bought Chelsea Football Club I mean uh, uh, the Premier League would still have questions to answer for the way they've handled um, the well the the biggest the biggest championship, soccer championship in the world, the Premier League, and uh, 120 years and more of heritage and tradition and community involvement and all the fans and how far the Premier League seems to have taken that away from its origins and its roots and that. And um, I don't know, I mean, did anyone ever anticipate back in 1992 how far down this rabbit hole the whole thing would go and that uh, the clubs the, the the grand old clubs of England would be subjected would be targeted by and not by unknown billionaires from all over the world and including from despotic autocratic horrible regimes of all descriptions and um, I don't know I mean it, it, does it does it does it nearly matter now? I mean, who 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 buys Chelsea? I mean, is it not just all over and far too late? And okay, they may be shamed into uh, mar- into marginalising a, a, a putative Saudi bid, and uh, they may be shamed into a, a ruling out on that. But it strikes me as being too late, and uh, and that the chaos and sort of kind of anarchy of this free market ultra capitalist anarchy of the Premier League is not going to be changed now and um, I don't know I mean I mean I have to confess I mean when Abramovich first came in and took over Chelsea I remember at the time my my primary reaction was brilliant uh, Manchester United the he- hegemony of Manchester United under Sir Alex is finally being challenged by someone who has the financial fire- firepower to take on uh, Old Trafford's firepower in the market and that therefore we're going to have for the next few years much more dramatic satisfying uh, title races you know and uh, I remember distinctly thinking that at the time and not questioning the source of uh, the money or indeed not envisaging in any way that the thing could spiral where you have uh, countries like uh, 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 where you have basically petrol millionaires from so billionaires from Saudi Arabia and from regimes that do deplorable things to people, uh, that they would end up buying Premier Premier League clubs. Well, uh, sports sorry, washers are going to sports wash, Tommy. So there's going to be plenty of people that will line up to buy Premier League clubs for various different reasons. And in Roman Ramovich's case, it suited him perfectly when he got out of Russia to become a person of interest in the UK and to have a base in the UK and to become you know highly visible as the head of Chelsea when he took over. Similarly, it's such a slippery slope once the UK government decided to get involved in this one because, you know, Al Saad, who my latest UK Syrian relations, uh, I think, reading sees that Al Saad is seen as a bad guy now by the UK, where they may have supported him once upon a time, but he was meeting with Man City's owners in the Gulf yesterday. 
the yeah. UK will happily sell weapons to Saudi Arabia and condemn yeah. you know, the killing of citizens and journalists, but at the same time they're happy to provide weaponry. At what point mm. do the UK government have to step in against Man City, say, if there's concerns about maybe... Yeah. You know issues in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they've they've set a precedent here by freezing Roman Ramovich's assets and stepping in. Yeah, I I even I like I I find myself even having to question the underlying assumption that sports washing, the sort of the laundering of uh, terrible reputations and financial crimes and crimes against humanity can somehow be laundered through the buying of a football club in England. I mean, that that seems to be the underlying assumption. And I don't know how... Did did um, did Roman Abramovich... Um, did he become a hero or a, a, national, a figure of national admiration because he led Chelsea to all their league titles and European success? And similarly, um, it, it's, the sports-washing term was used when Saudi Arabia bought Newcastle United. And yet, um, the absolutely atrocious um, execution of 81 people there uh, probably would have been uh, hidden in the bottom in a corner of page 12 of the newspapers if they hadn't bought Newcastle United. And that absolutely repugnant uh, act that they perpetrated, uh, these state executions, was global news simply because of their connection to uh, Newcastle United, not simply because, but partly, at least in part because, their profile escalated, and suddenly there was a lot of people, uh, and to the extent that um, Don, uh, um, uh, the, I was going to say Don Howe, uh, uh, Eddie, the Howe. Manager, Eddie Howe, mm. has been questioned about state-sponsored executions in Saudi Arabia. So how is that sports washing? It, it, it seems to me it has only exposed the absolute terror of that regime. So I, I, I actually don't know, Will, what what their motivations are, what what the, uh, apart, apart from, I guess, in the case, in this case, and what we see in the mail on Sunday, American billionaire investors looking to acquire an asset. That seems more understandable, uh, or at, at least simpler. That is a, 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 apparently a number of billionaire investors uh, in America and indeed in the UK who want to buy one of the world's big sporting franchises. Yeah, I, think I would say as well, Tommy, I think that part of the, the sports washing is that the Saudis don't care that me and you know that they've been doing terrible things to their own people and to well, other How do we know that, Maura like Tessa? Because How if do they, we know did, they don't know? They wouldn't be drawing, they know that this would draw attention to it. I think the reason why they're they're engaging in this kind of sports washing is the access it gives them. By owning these clubs, they are involved and in meeting some of the world's most powerful and richest people as well, and glad-handing them. Like, we saw the pictures there a few weeks ago of some of the British Parliament and some of the people they were hanging around with, you know, perhaps even unbeknownst to them, but I think it's it's their version of soft power. I think that's what they're doing. Uh, this could be very cynical of me, but I think that's what it is. They, they don't care what the likes of me and you think because we don't have any money to give them and we don't have any arms for them either. And we're also not going to stop them shooting and killing children in Yemen and Syria. Yeah, well, the, the ultimate soft power is if you're hosting a Formula One Grand Prix where the eyes of the world are on it because of Max Verstappen against Lewis Hamilton. And even though Hamilton is coming out and wearing a helmet, which is speaking out against uh, LGBT issues, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia, at the same time, all eyes are on a shiny stadium in Jeddah and the end of the season. And similarly, WWE have been going to Saudi Arabia and being paid huge money to go and get them across American TV and all the benefits that come around that. I, I think there's going to be no stopping um, these countries from still buying into sport. And ultimately, one of the concerns around Chelsea will be how can the billionaires afford the probably two billion plus that's going to be required, even if Ron Bramwich isn't going to lose a penny by leaving the club? Um, another one, Maura Trask, that I thought was quite interesting is um, Ollie Holt writes about Marcus Rashford today. Uh, Rashford yes. has yeah. been kind of getting both barrels because of the fact that he reacted during the week. Manchester United get beaten by Atletico Madrid. Some of his own fans started giving him a bit of crap while he was on the way out of Old Trafford. And he stopped and reacted, which was a very human reaction, I thought, from Marcus Rashford, who... You know, he doesn't need that when he's on the way out of his team being knocked out of Europe. For sure. And I think, isn't that part of the problem too, that people seem to think that Marcus Rashford is one of the biggest problems in Man United? Um, he's not. He's far from the biggest problem. And 
I, I thought the article was was written really well. Like he's he's still a young man. You'd forget how young he still is, and it lays out you know how much he has scored as well over the last few years, and he's in a different form. And instead of abusing the lad, why don't we ask why? Where's this tip coming from? What what help can we give him to recover his form? And um, like now again, maybe speaking about some horrible despots there a few minutes ago that Tommy really articul- articulated really well, but some of the terrible things they do. Like Marcus Rashford is the antidote to that. A man who took on the British government last year because they didn't want to feed poor kids during a lockdown. And it just goes to show it doesn't matter how much good you do. And it's probably a lesson that managers and players and actually politicians should learn as well. You're only as good as your last game. And it doesn't take long for the tide of opinion of people who've decided to only think in black and white and to not see the nuances and colour of life to decide that you are now persona non grata and not the Glazers who have allowed this situation to perpetuate over years and years and years and who keep doing stupid things, like really dumb things. Like who thought bringing Ronaldo to United was a good idea? Mm. Tommy, I know the time is going to catch up with us here, so I want to give you a shout on David Walsh here because, again, we're you know a week on from losing the composer of the Fields of Athenry, but the Fields of Athenry sang many times at Cheltenham this week, and you know it's a nice little angle into the story from yeah, David Walsh lovely. around Rachel Blackmore this week as well. It's lovely, Will. Yeah, it's just a really nice paints a, a scene uh, in a hotel. Uh, in Cheltenham, um, and he links it to the death of Pete St. John last week. And it's just a lovely, something different. And um, uh, and how he, David, uh, made the links in, with his customary skill in this piece. Uh, and he starts out with Pete St. John, uh, who died at the age of 90 in a Dublin hospital. Uh, and then, okay, well, where is where is this taking us then? And then he, he, uh, he uh, through the paragraphs then, he makes the connection and he says that um, uh, uh, the most famous version of the Fields of Ath and Rye is by Paddy Riley. And here's the Cheltenham connection then. Paddy Riley is now 82 and attended Pete St. John's funeral in Dublin on Monday. And after that, he went to Cheltenham with his son, Kieran, and they stayed in a, in a hotel a few miles from the race course. And in the hotel was Willie Mullins and his wife. And um, Paddy, Paddy Riley once had horses in training with Willie Mullins' father, Paddy, Mullen, Paddy Mullins. Michael Carrick, the former Man United in England player, was there with his wife. And, uh, and, so the, and at the end of a very apparently convivial evening in the hotel, uh, Paddy Riley is, uh, is uh, prevailed upon to sing the Fields of Athen Rye and David says he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't do. He's at a stage in his life where he doesn't sing every time he's asked. But he sang this Fields of Athen Rye and stilled the bar. And um, and I loved that scene that David picked. And I had a sort of slightly personal connection because when I heard that Pete St John died during the week, I had a twinge of regret and maybe even remorse because. I wrote a piece uh, about 11 years ago wondering, there was a documentary about the fields of Athen Rye, and I was wrote a piece wondering why did this essentially mawkish, sentimental, self-pitying ballad become the song of choice of Irish supporters in stadiums in Ireland and across the world at a time when we've never been richer or more affluent uh, or more educated as a nation. And I got a, I got an email from Pete St. John the following week, a very civil, uh, more civil than he uh, ne- than he needed to be, given what I wrote about the song. And uh, and we had an email exchange, uh, I, I would hope a good humoured and civil email exchange in the weeks and months, in the weeks and months thereafter. And he, I never met him, but he was a lovely man. And irrespective of what I said about the fields of Athen Rye, um, uh, Pete St. John has left behind, uh, I suppose, a song that will last forever in Irish culture. Mm. And Maura Trassa, Rachel Blackmore features really across the papers and um, understandably, uh, given the week that she's had at Cheltenham and again, more of a breakthrough. I'm looking at uh, the Sunday Times, just a couple of pages before David Walsh, have got a piece about her golden touch, the fact that when she was in her 20s, she was still a point to pointer and here she is now breaking all sorts of records and Daryl Corr has got a lovely piece on her steely resolve, which was shown during the week too and particularly seen on that ride on Plus Tard on Friday as well. Um, it's great to see Rachel Blackmore, you know, such a kind of a, a calm, composed, um, athlete as well, Maura Trassi. She seems to pick up all these accolades, swept the boards at all the awards last December, and still she just as if she's just come off a winner in Thurless on a Thursday afternoon. 
which is what she did this weekend. Apparently, mm. she was in Thurless this weekend. Like, it's be it the Gold Cup, be it Thurless, be it a point to point in Kerry. It, and maybe that's the secret to success. It's all treated the same. It is all the same respect is given to every single race, every single mount, every single owner. And to be honest, sometimes when you're watching a legend in the making, we mightn't appreciate how much they've already achieved or it, it's not to the benefit of hindsight and time that you realize how, how good they were and I, I obviously we all know she's good but i just thought Eamon sweeney on the back page of the sindo laid it out really well when he said he basically pointed out right at the top of his piece when tony mccall won the cheltenham gold cup champions hurdle double few would have thought it'd be a quarter of a century before that feat was repeated now first of all that's massive 25 years Nobody have predicted the next double winner would be a girl from Tipperary who was then still several months away from her eighth birthday. So this is how young this woman is. Not many more back then would have forecast that a female jockey would have emulated McCoy's festival feat, something which proved beyond such greats as Ruby Walsh, Barry Garrity and Mick Fitzgerald. Yet there was Rachel Blackmore, maker of history, breaker of barriers, rider of champions, doing it all and doing it with a smile doing it, you know, with the utmost of respect for herself and her horse and her trainers and everyone else who works around her. And it's just normal. It's it's her normal. And I think it comes back to that piece you mentioned there, the Golden Touch in uh, the Sunday Times. You know, at the end, um, Willie Mullins is describing her and he says, horses respond to her. She communicates with them to get down and gallop. And that's it. Whatever a horse whisperer does, she has it. But she does it in such a way that is so endearing, isn't it? I mean, so often champion athletes in any sport, they can be really odious individuals. You know, they're just selfish people who got there because they have a, they have a lot of talent and have been really, really focused. Whereas she's just, everyone wants to be her friend and everyone kind of wants to mind her as well. It's a bit like Kelly Harrington. It's a lovely place to hold, I think, in all sports fans' hearts. And I just hope more power to the girl. And she's got so many more years ahead of her, you'd hope. Yeah, and a great late bloomer in sport as well, which gives hope to those who maybe mm. uh, don't hit the ground running straight away. Tommy, Maura Trasset, thanks a million for joining us on the Sunday Paper Review. Pleasure, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Maura Trasset. And if you want to have a listen back, uh, you can go to the podcast uh, section on OTB Sports and have a listen back. Uh, it will be up a little bit later on today. Um, just to give you the scores from elsewhere, we're going to be talking rugby with Keane Tracy and with Shane Byrne uh, a little bit later on in the programme. Leicester lead against Brentford by two goals to nil at half time in the Premier League. Uh, Constantia scored the first one for the Foxes, the second uh, coming from Madison uh, late in the first half. So they lead by two goals to nil. If the Foxes were to win that game, they've had such a middling season uh, but they would move back up into the top half if they were to get a victory uh, Brentford as things stand are 8 points above the drop zone and you would think they've probably done enough to stay in the Premier League for a second year uh, but let's see if the Bees can come back in the second half we'll have live commentary with Stephen Doyle and also with Brian Kerr at half past four on the London Derby between Tottenham and West Ham uh, West Ham's fourth London Derby of the season and they've won three so far in the QPR game against Peterborough in the Championship QPR led early on in the game but Peterborough scored three times without reply uh, to win by three goals to one so QPR uh, continued to sit just outside the playoff spots in the championship just one win in five for the Oars in the league and Peterborough it is a boost for their hopes of staying in the championship for next season they move up to 26 points with their first win in five games uh, but they still are quite a bit behind uh, they are still seven points away from the drop zone with Reading sitting just outside the uh, bottom three as things stand meanwhile Crystal Palace beating Everton by four goals to nil as we heard from Nigel Bidmead a little bit earlier on so Crystal Palace are going back to Wembley uh, two of those goals coming quite late on from Hughes and from Zaha putting just a little bit of gloss onto the scoreline at the end uh, Palace beating Everton by four goals to nil still to come we've got Southampton against Man City that game kicks off in around about six minutes time and Nottingham Forest against Liverpool is the late game at 6pm we'll take a very short break when we come back we'll be taking a look at Ireland uh, winning the triple crown with their bonus point victory against Scotland and France being crowned the Grand Slam winners in the Six Nations for the first time in over a decade the Sunday Papers on Off The Ball.